Part 4. How to use Python for Natural Language Processing. In this recording, I will cover the following topics. I will talk a little bit about the positioning, because natural language processing is a broad field and I cannot discuss everything in one recording. So I'll set a couple boundaries as to what I will and will not discuss. Talk a little bit about terminology, Python tools for natural language processing, and then I'll go into some specific topics that relate to natural language processing. And I'll show you some code examples and how you can accomplish these using the Python programming language. So where does this session fit into the bigger scheme of natural language processing? Generally speaking, there's five steps to a project that involves natural language processing. First of all, you would have to determine, is it worthwhile to look into textual data? If so, what are the sources that I can use? How can I extract the data from these sources? And then finally, how can I process and analyze this textual data? This recording will focus primarily on the last two steps. The steps on how to gather textual data, you can use the gathering data from the web recording to familiarize yourself with the third step. And the first two steps will depend on your research question. But in this recording, I will focus specifically on processing and analyzing textual data. There are some terminologies that I would like to get out of the way. Um, And whenever you talk about natural language processing or using textual data in your research projects, you'll see a bunch of different terms being thrown around. Some people talk about computational linguistics. Some people talk about textual analysis. Some people are talking about text mining. And then you have people like myself who are talking about natural language processing. Now, generally speaking, you can consider all of these as interchangeable. Um, They all relate to the study, generally using statistical methods, of textual data. However, there are some small kind of minor differences and nuances that, in my mind, make it so that natural language processing is kind of the term that I prefer to use. And the primary reason for that is that computational linguistics, I don't think what we do is necessarily computational linguistics because computational linguistics are linguists we're using computational techniques to study language. We don't usually study language in that particular way. Uh, we don't try to understand how the English language is evolving. We just try to make some classification or get some statistical or numerical representation of a text so that we can plug it into our statistical models. Textual analysis, I would say textual analysis is a, is a pretty good term. I don't have much problem with that, but it does focus very heavily on the analysis portion whereas the far majority of your time is going to be spent on getting your textual data ready so that you can actually analyze it. Text mining, text mining generally has a little bit of a negative connotation to it, at least within research terms, um, because we don't like data mining. Text mining is primarily used in the context of auditing, for example, where you might have a whole bunch of text and you want to mine information out of that in order to find cases of misconduct or cases of fraud or cases of compatibility issues or whatever. Uh, I don't think that's generally what we do as academics because we want to do hypothesis testing. So we generally have a very specific goal in mind and we don't want to just get something out of the text. We don't want to find patterns that don't make sense. We generally just say, well, we want to identify these things or these things and we want to have a method to doing that. So I like to refer to these type of projects as involving natural language processing, primarily because most of your time is going to be spent on that processing step, because that's the main difficulty of textual data. Numerical data, you just take your numerical numbers, you might have to do a little bit of cleanup, but then you can put them into your statistical models. Natural language is inherently very complex and is very different than numerical data. So there's a lot of steps that you have to go through in order to get your data to the point where you can actually process it. But I think textual analysis is also perfectly fine to use in this context. So which programming language or software should you use for natural language processing? Well, personally, as obvious by this course, is I very much prefer to use Python. The reasons for this are the same reasons why I like to use Python for other things as well. It's an easy to use language. It has a wide variety of packages, a great ecosystem, a great support structure. And it's also one of the primary languages that people have settled on using when it comes to processing textual data. You have some alternatives as well. You can use R, and that will work fine for the far majority of cases. But ultimately, I would say Python is better suited simply because R, in a way, is a statistical language. It's used for statistical analysis. Python is a general programming language, which means it has a lot more flexibility when it comes to non-numerical data. 
And finally, you, there's a little bit of an honorary mansion for Perl, which back in the day, Perl was kind of designed as a language that you could use in order to deal with textual data. So early research that was looking into that tended to use Perl. Perl is not much of a supported language right now. Um, so unless you have to, unless you're given code that you have to work with, I would say stay away with Perl. Python is just a supercharged version of that. Anything you could do with Perl or R, you can definitely do with Python, but the other way around is not necessarily the case. So what are my recommendations when it comes to Python libraries? Now, there are a lot of different libraries here when it comes to processing textual data with Python. Um, over the years, I've gone through many of them um, and I've kind of settled on two main groups of tools that I'd like to use. One, there's no way around kind of the dinosaur in the natural language processing world of Python, which is called NLTK, which is a toolkit, natural language toolkit that has been developed a long time ago and it still has a solid standing uh, when it comes to processing textual data with Python. And it, you can allow, or you can use it to do basic text processing. I have nothing against NLTK, but it is a very old library. It uses very old techniques. The documentation is pretty horrible. Um, and generally speaking, I just don't enjoy using it. So unless I have to, I, I shy away from it. I'd much rather use text blob or spacey. Now text blob is a package that wraps around the NLTK kind of infrastructure. So it under the hood uses much of NLTK, but it puts it in a more modern framework and it uses more modern function calls and all of that. And it's just generally a lot more pleasurable to use. So whenever you have to kind of do basic NLP tasks using Python, I would generally recommend to start with text blob. But as soon as you want to do something that's a little bit more serious, that's a little bit more involved, you want to use more state of the art techniques, you want to um, kind of use, for example, send to segmentation that, that goes beyond the standard techniques and that uses machine learning and all of that under the hood in order to get better performance. You could try to program all of that from scratch, so that, that'd be um, a very time consuming job. Fortunately, there is a, a truly amazing effort that is called Spacey. And Spacey is a relatively young library, but it has quickly gained a very large following when it comes to people that do NLP research. The Spacey library is a library that allows you to apply many state-of-the-art machine learning techniques onto text without you having to interact with any of the machine learning. It just has pre-compiled models that you can use and under the hood will use those models to do a pretty fancy things like entity recognition or sentence segmentation or uh, anything you really would like to do with uh, textual data. So I personally always use Spacey for almost anything unless it's a really small or quick and dirty project, and then I would use text blob. Uh, the downside of Spacey is that obviously it's more powerful, which means it comes with more functionality. And because it has more functionality, you can take a little bit more time to get used to how to use it and really take a grasp of, of all the things that you can do with the Spacey library. Now, often an objective might be in order to use your textual data as an input for some machine learning. If you were to do that, Python is really the go-to language in order to do that. There's an amazing scikit-learn library that has a lot of machine learning algorithms already built in. And you can just process your text using text blob or spacey, then feed it into scikit-learn, do your machine learning, and then you can essentially take the output and put it in whatever statistical model you want to put it in. Uh, and an honorable mention is GenSim, which is if you really want to do topic modeling, then there, it, this GenSim library is kind of the library that everyone will use in order to do word embeddings or anything along those lines. Um, you can do some of that with Spacey, you can do some of that with Scikit-Learn, but ultimately GenSim is kind of the core library that you want to use if you really want to do this seriously. But with these tools, you essentially got your entire spectrum of potential NLP operations covered, and it's all within the Python ecosystem. Now, when it comes to natural language processing, not specifically to Python, but just in general, um, I've created this little diagram here that I'd like to use in order to put everything into perspective. And I would say that generally any NLP project will have to follow kind of this flowchart, where you would have to start with processing and cleaning your data, which is this step at the top here. Now the step at the top, the process and cleaning, it's not the most exciting part, but it is very important because garbage in, garbage out is, is very relevant in the context of textual data 
And if you don't do this first step appropriately, then anything else you do later on, irrespective of how fancy it is, is going to be flawed by definition. So you want to make sure that you kind of take this step seriously, because if you don't, then anything after that is kind of a waste of time. So you start with that, and then you can go either of two routes. You could either go kind of the simple route, which I will refer to as the direct feature extraction route, which means you take your processed actual data and you're going to do some counts or you're going to do some regular expression and then you're going to be done with it. So that's kind of the simple route, but you can also go the machine learning route. But then if you were to go that route, you would have to do an intermediate advanced step, which is you will have to represent your text in a numerical way. Because if you think about machine learning, they're just statistical models, just like OLS or any other linear regression, but you cannot put text into an OLS model. You will have to convert it into a bunch of numbers, a vector of some sort first, before you can put it into the statistical model. So if you want to go that statistical route and you want to do some, some analysis using machine learning, then you'll have to represent it numerically. And I'll talk a little bit about that. And then once you've figured that out, you can then dump it into whatever statistical model you want. I'm not going to talk about this machine learning portion too much because that's a kind of out of scope for natural language processing. Um, but if you want to know more about it, I do have links to this in the reference materials. Um, and I'll give you a little bit of a primer at the end of this recording. So I want to start with the step of processing and cleaning your data. And as I mentioned, this is a boring step, but it is a very important one. Now there's a wide variety of things that you might have to do to your text in order to get it uh, suitable for you to either do direct feature extraction or to analyze it using machine learning. And the first one is that you might have to do some text normalization. Text normalization means that if you get a bunch of text, natural language generally has certain constructs, sentences, paragraphs, words. And most of your analysis, you say, well, I want to do this analysis at the word level, or I want to do them at the sentence level, or the paragraph level, or the page level, or the whatever. Text normalization means that you identify these kind of subcategories of text. The most common one would be sentence segmentation, which is split it up into different sentences, or to do word tokenization, which is to split it up into different words. You might also do some other normalizations. Uh, for example, maybe you want to change all URLs into kind of something that can actually be compared, or you want to change all company names into something that is generic so that it can actually be picked up as a company name or person name or place names or whatever. And you could also decide, well, I want to make the text a little bit more comparable by changing all of the different words. And I will words, use words and tokens interchangeably, kind of boils down to the same thing for the majority of operations. Might be that you say, well, I want to change everything to singular so that whenever I have to text, it becomes a little bit easier to compare these two things. Uh, personally, I don't use these two techniques too often, but uh, I will still show you a brief example in case you do want to do that for your particular project. Now, whenever you read a paper that uses NLP and they're processing some data, they will generally at some point talk about unigrams or n-grams or bigrams or trigrams or whatever. In my experience, these don't always make that big of a difference. So I don't usually bother, um, in particular, if you use more advanced statistical models because they, they don't really benefit from this that much. But just so that we're on the same page as to what this means is that a unigram is just the token by itself. So if you were to do everything at the unigram level, that means that if you have a sentence, like here, like Tilburg University is located in North Brabant, then if I were to create a unigram representation, I would just split all the words up and then it would have Tilburg University is located, blah, blah, blah. If I want to create bigrams, then what I would do is I create two token pairs and I would consider each pair as a single token. So in this case, I would have Tilburg University, at what university is, is located, located in, in North and North Brabant. And the benefit of this is that, for example, for like Tilburg University, it might be more informational. It might have a higher entry, be a higher information value. If you refer to something as Tilburg University combined compared to if you talk about Tilburg and university separately, because in this case, the fact that these two are related is kind of um, ignore it, whereas here we do realize that these two might have a joint meaning. And the same thing for this place name, such as this Dutch province called Noord-Brabant. And you can make this with any n 
amount of combinations. So if you were to do a trigram, then you would have an end game with three tokens. So you would have Tilburg University is, University is located, is located, located in North and in North Brabant. And you can make this four, five, six, and you make this as long as you want to. Um, I have code examples in the reference notebook if you want to implement this. Um, it doesn't hurt to try, but in my experience, you might be better off with these unigrams in your far majority of cases, unless you have a very specific reason to go for either a bigram or a trigram. So I've kind of skipped over some of this, um, this process and cleaning, because you might have to deal with encoding issues. You might have to deal with the fact that you have weird characters in your, your data. You might have to deal with the fact that it's spread across different files. Uh, this is all very specific to your type of document and your research project, so it's hard for me to talk about, but realize that there might be a lot more that goes into that. And the only way to figure that out is by actually opening up your text files, go through it, try to understand what your code is doing. So let's say that we have now processed and cleaned our text. We spend days, weeks, months, however long it takes us to get to that step, and we're now able to actually start analyzing some of this data. At least within accounting research, many papers will just code the direct feature extraction route. For example, count words for certain things, or they try to extract specific mentions to companies or names or things or documents, and then kind of use that. Um, so that's what I'll show you first. And then I'll talk a little bit about the, the more advanced route, which is my personal favorite. Now, the first thing is that, and this pattern search is not specific to direct feature extraction. You will also use it a lot for processing and cleaning, but I, I put it here because I have to put it somewhere. Pattern search means that sometimes you want to look for something specific, but you don't know exactly what the specific word is going to be, but you do know the pattern in which it will appear in your text. So for example, let's say I have some strings here and my goal is I want to get the ID numbers out of this. I mean, this is just an artificial example, right? But I do not yet know what the IDs are of these different people, because if I already knew, then I would not have to find them in the text. So I know there's going to be ID numbers there. I know they're going to kind of follow this fixed format, but I do not know exactly what these numbers and letters are going to be. Now I can use a pattern search using a kind of a separate language of its own that's, that are called regular expressions. And regular expression allow you to specify text patterns without being super specific about what the actual content is. So for example, here I would know that generally speaking, these IDs number would follow up as you'd have a hash and then you have ID number and then a colon and a space. And then here, I specify backslash D to indicate that I expect a digit. I don't know what the digit is, but I know it's going to be a digit. And backslash W, which stands for a for either a word or an alphanumerical character, such as a letter. And those are separated by a dash. And then I wrap that in parentheses to indicate that that's kind of what I try to capture. That's what I get to try to extract out of this piece of text. So I can define this regular expression, this pattern, and then I can tell Python, and this is all done using the built-in RE library in Python, that I want to look for anything that matches that particular pattern. So in this case, I can say, well, I'll go to string one, apply that pattern, and then try to extract the ID number out of it. And I will do that, and you will see here that then what I end up with is actually one, two, three, bar AZ, and 663 bar BY as extracted from this piece of text. Now, this is extremely useful because imagine in this situation, I'm just looking for these numbers and that's kind of my end goal. But let's say that I'm processing Edgar filings, like um, an annual report, and I want to get a particular section. I don't know exactly what's going to be in that section, but I do know that generally it starts with a particular header and it might end with another header. So I can generate a regular expression that says, well, look for that header look for the ending header and then just look for anything in between and whatever is in between, that's what I want. And then you can run that and then you can get the information out of it. Or let's say that you want to get all of the numbers, all of the dollar values or percentages out of a piece of text. You don't know what exactly the numbers are, but you do know that either before or after that number is going to be a percent or a dollar sign. So you can write a regular expression that looks for these percentages and then looks for numbers that are before or after it, for example. And this is just among one of many things you can do. Now, besides it being super useful, it can also be a huge headache. And the reason is that, 
Well, computers, they love patterns and they can look at that regular expression that we've made and carefully crafted and completely understand what that's supposed to do. But if you go to the internet and you go to Stack Overflow or something and you look up some of these regular expressions that people come up with, you might look at them and you might have no idea what they're doing. And that's always a little bit tricky because one, that does indicate that sometimes it can be very difficult to create these regular expressions, but you also just don't want to copy something into your code that you don't fully understand because that's just asking for unintended consequences or unintended behavior that might creep up later on without you realizing it. Now, in order to deal with this, in order to make this a little bit easier, I have reference material to all the different regular expression syntax. But in my experience, just doing trial and error is a lot more efficient of a method. And there's two great websites, one called pythex.org and regex101.com that allow you to put in a piece of text and put in a regular expression and it will immediately show you what that regular expression will capture. And this saves you the trouble of putting that into Python, running the code, see if it worked or not, because that's a, a little bit of a slow process. Whereas in Pythax or regex101, you will literally see within half a second whether it's working or not, and you can just kind of try around. So I have an example here. So this is the Pythax website, and I've put in the exact same example that I had in my slides. And you can see here at the top, I put in the regular expression that I would like to test. And then here I put a test string, and then here it will immediately show me whether this is working or not. So if I were to, for example, play around with this, and then all of a sudden this disappears, and it shows me here what the output will be, then I know, hey, I probably need to change it, and you can just play around with it until it works. It also shows you at the bottom here a nice cheat sheet. And this is, I open this cheat sheet actually more often than I open up the Pythex um, kind of interpreter or tester, because this is, this is a really great cheat sheet for the Python regular expression syntax. And it shows you all the different things, and whenever I forget something, I just quickly open this up, look it up, and then I'm good to go again. Now, I will not show you the Regex 101 website because it's mostly the same. Now, the only thing that Regex 101 does different or provides in addition to what Pythax Orc can provide you is that it will try to give you a visual representation of why the regular expression does what it does. So sometimes when you find a regular expression on the internet and you don't really understand what it's doing, you might be able to put that regular expression into regex101.com and it will give you a visual representation of the steps that leads it to make the match that it does. So that can kind of be a nice way to figure out, reverse engineer why your regular expression is working the way it is. Another thing that you can do in the direct feature extraction kind of space is you can do a keyword search. And keyword searches are, at least within the social sciences, relatively common, which would be that, let's say you have a certain list of words, positive words or negative words or litigation words or uncertainty words or forward-looking, whatever, and you want to make a count as to how many times these words occur in a document. Some papers make this look like it's a, it's a very advanced technique, but in reality, it really isn't. Like, it's extremely simple to do this uh, when it comes to just counting the words. Because, for example, I can show you if we wanted to do something like a Laffer McDonald sentiment analysis uh, word count, all we would have to do is we would have kind of to load in our list of words, we would have our sentence, and then we just literally loop over the words. And then we use the count function, and that will tell us how many of these words occurred. Um, we have to specify lower in this case because lower and uppercase, that's just the thing you want to look out for. And then we will get the amount of counts and we can calculate any metric that we want out of these. Now, running these counts is easy. It, it really is. It's not that many lines of code. Coming up with this word list is really, really hard. And that's why papers that were able to figure that out and come up with a word list get used so often because it's way easier to look up a paper, look in the appendix and get the word list and just count those instead of trying to come up with those yourself. That's where kind of machine learning comes in because it allows you to do the same thing, but without having to specify these word lists directly because you can kind of reverse engineer or let the code reverse engineer what these word lists need to be. Uh, but just understand that if you ever want to do this, even though the code is simple, the technique itself can be pretty difficult because you have to figure out what those word lists need to be. One thing worth noting here, if you're watching this as an accounting researcher, I have a list of different references that use these various techniques. I'll just quickly put them on the screen, but I will not go through them. Um, if you don't do accounting research, you can just skip over these slides. 
Now, the last thing when it, when it comes to feature extraction is there is also a bunch of different metrics that are almost ready made that you can just apply to a piece of text. Um, these can be simple algorithms. This can also be pretty advanced machine learning, but specifically machine learning models that have already been trained and have been packaged up and you can just apply them to your text. In that case, you don't need to concern yourself with machine learning and setting that up and doing all of that stuff. You just take the model as is, you apply it to your text and it spits out a number. Things you can do with this is you can detect the language that can be useful sometimes. You can calculate readability scores. Uh, there's packages for that. Generally speaking, I advise you to just calculate these yourselves using Spacey um, because it's not that difficult. And finally, you can calculate text similarity. If you want to do text similarity calculations, there are two ma main ways that you might want to explore. There's the Fuzzy Wuzzy library, which I know names, uh, but the Fuzzy Wuzzy library will allow you to do fuzzy matching. And you can give it two sentences and it will give you kind of a fuzzy ratio to indicate how similar these are when it comes to the amount of words or the, the type of words that are included in that sentence. But you can also do it based on semantic similarity using some of the word embeddings that I have reference material of. If you want to look into that, just look in the reference material. Uh, but just know that there's those two main techniques that you can apply. Uh, this text similarity can also be useful if you, for example, want to look for different company names, but you're not entirely sure whether they're going to follow the exact same spelling every time, you might be able to use this to still match them up, even though they're 95% the same, but not 100% the same. Now we've talked about cleaning and processing the text. We've talked about direct feature extraction, but what if we decided, well, we want to go the, uh, the full mile and we want to kind of dig into some machine learning. Uh, personally, I think this is a very promising and an interesting way of, of dealing with textual data. There's a lot of cool things you can do. But at the same time, if you just want to get some basic textual analysis done, you don't need to concern yourself with all of this machine learning. You can do a lot by just going the direct feature extraction route. And there's nothing wrong with doing that. For some projects, I just go that route because it's all I need to do. But sometimes, in particular, if you have more complicated questions, it might be worthwhile to invest the time and effort into going this route because you can do things and you can provide contributions that you might not be able to realize otherwise. So as I said, if you want to go the machine learning route, you will have to do two steps. You'll have to first represent the text in a somewhat of a numerical way, convert it into a vector of numbers, if you will. And then what you can do is once you've done that, you can take that vector of numbers and then you can put that into your statistical models. And I'll talk a little bit about both of these. Now, the most old school and easiest way to convert a piece of text into a numerical representation is to use what we call the bag of words. This is also sometimes referred to as the frequency-based representation or term frequency. Now, the way the bag of words approach works is that it will take the piece of text, it will ignore the fact that there are sentences and on word order and sentence order, it will ignore all of that. It will just try to identify the different words and then it will put that all in one big bag and it will just count how many times each word occurs. And that's why it's called a bag of words because you, you kind of toss everything into one big bag and you ignore the fact that there's all these other natural language features that are in that text, but you just say, it's just words. I'm just gonna count how many times each word occurs. And then what you would get is you would essentially get a, a vector that you can use. And if you do this for all the documents, then you know, okay, these are all the words that I have. You can call this a dictionary, if you will, and then you say, well, I'm just going to, for all these words, count how many times each word occurs in the different documents, and then that will give you a vector that you have for each piece of text, and then you can use that for your statistical models. So it's a relatively simple technique, actually. So I have an example here. Let's say I have four different sentences. The sky is blue. The sun is bright today. The sun in the sky is bright, and we can see the shining sun, the bright sun. And then if I were to create the term frequency, the bag of words numerical representation of this, I would get something like this, where I find all the words that occur in these documents. And then for each of them, I go through these and I count how many times that word occurs. Now, the only thing here is that one, the collection of text documents is usually referred to as the corpus. Doesn't really matter, but in case you see that term pops up, you know what it refers to. And second of all, you can do these term frequencies of one or two ways. You can do them by the actual amount of counts. If it occurs five times, you put the number five there or you can do the one hot representation, which means if it occurs, you get a one. If it doesn't occur, you get zero, but it doesn't matter how many times it occurs in a document. As long as it occurs at least once, you will give it a one and otherwise it's going to be zero. 
uh, the one zero representation is, is more common, generally speaking, because it's a little bit more comparable. Uh, there's also an alternative version of this where you try to figure out which words are very common and which words are less common, and then you weigh it by how common a word is. The idea would be that if a word is not very uncommon, um, then it doesn't have it doesn't have much informational value, whether if a word doesn't occur very often, then it might have a lot of informational value. You can do that weighing, the formulas are here. You can do that. The only real difference is that in that case, you don't have zero, one anymore or zero, and then well, however many counts you have, but in that case, you end up with some form of a percentage because you get a ratio. If you want to do that, you can do that. You can try both and see whatever works best. Now, there is an alternative approach and it's becoming more and more commonplace, even within social science research, to use the alternative method. Um, and the alternative method is what we call word embeddings. And word embeddings are a little bit more of an advanced technique to numerically represent what a text is. And essentially what it tries to do is it tries to uncover a bunch of topics, let's say 100 topics or 300 topics, and it tries to figure out kind of some underlying semantics that relate to each of these different topics. And it's out of scope for this recording how that exactly works, but just know that this will give you a model and anytime you put a text into that model, it will tell you based on all these different dimensions, 100 or 300, depending on the model you use, kind of how much it loads on that particular dimension. And then the idea would be that two documents that load very high on the same dimension are going to be very similar but documents that load highly on different dimensions are going to be different. And the idea would be that, for example, if you were to have two sentences, which is a Ferrari is a fast car and a Lamborghini is a fast car, then if you were to use the, um, the bag of words approach, Ferrari and Lamborghini are going to be treated as separate words because like, it's not able to distinguish between a Ferrari and a Lamborghini, even though these are relatively similar. And from a semantic point of view, they should indicate very much the same thing as in a fast sports car. Word embeddings will figure out that Ferrari is very similar to Lamborghini and that these two sentences should be very similar just because of that reason. There's a lot that goes into this and these word embeddings are kind of what they call the secret sauce for a lot of the machine learning models that we see coming out of Google and Facebook and what have you. They're already getting quite old at this point, but it always takes a little while for these things to become um, kind of easy to use and widespread in particular for social science research. So if you ever do this seriously and you really start to get into machine learning, I highly recommend you look into these word embeddings. And even if you want to do some basic machine learning, it's becoming so easy nowadays that you might even just consider plugging some of that code in. It's all into reference materials and just see whether that increases your accuracy compared to the bag of words approach. Okay. So we figured out how to represent our text numerically. And now the only thing that's left is to do the actual machine learning. The actual machine learning can be relatively easy because there's a lot of libraries out there. There's packages that we can use. And once we have all of our data ready, a couple is just, or it often is just a couple lines of code in order to get that running. Uh, and then doing it well with the right parameters, that takes a lot of practice. But from a code perspective, you usually don't need that much code in order to make that work. Now within the realm of machine learning, you have the quote unquote traditional machine learning, which is what I'll talk about. And you have all the deep neural networks and the very big models. I'm not going to talk about that, but just to realize that generally speaking, those fall in the category of machine learning, but they're kind of a category of its own as well. For the most part, those are out of scope for what we do in social science research, unless you really have a, a very complicated NLP problem. And in that case, it might be worthwhile to look into that. But I'll just talk about the quote unquote traditional machine learning more specifically, supervised and unsupervised. So what is machine learning? Well, machine learning is just a statistical model and it is a algorithm that is not explicitly programmed to behave in a certain way but it tries to reverse engineer what logic it should use based on input and output data so you give it some training data and the training data already has all the answers in it okay and then it will try to figure out how it can go from the inputs to the outputs now if this sounds familiar then you can actually realize that a linear regression on OLS model is in many ways also just machine learning. Because all that you do is you would put in your X variables, you, you would try to predict your Y variable, right? And then what the OLS is trying to do is it's trying to figure out how it can go from X to Y. And then we do statistical like significance testing and hypothesis testing to figure out whether those relationships are significant or not. 
but ultimately you can use a linear regression for machine learning as well. The only difference is that generally machine learning is used for prediction and not so much for hypothesis testing. So an example for the sentiment analysis, the traditional method would be that in the direct feature extraction route, we would manually create our positive negative word lists, and then we would just count how many times positive words occur and how many times negative words occur. If we were to go the machine learning route, then what we would do is we would not specify the word lists, but instead we would get a training sample, sentences or documents, and we would say, okay, this one is positive, this one is negative, this one is positive, this one is negative, this one's positive, blah, blah, blah. And then we're going to use that as output because we want the algorithm to, to kind of figure out how it can determine that this one needs to be positive and this one needs to be negative. And then we feed it the input text, the numerical representation of that input text. We tell it how we classify it to that document and what we want it to be classified as. And then the machine learning will try to figure out how it can go from the text to that classification. And then at the end, we'll get a model out of that. And in a way, you can think about that model as that model has figured out what the word lists need to be and what words will be reflective of a positive text and what words are going to be reflective of a negative text. Both come with pros and cons. The first method with the word lists, once you have the word list, that's way easier. But it does come at the, like at the cost of you have to subjectively create this word list. Machine learning, you have to get training data. So that takes effort, but you don't have to make decisions on what you want the words to be and how you want them to be classified because the algorithm will try to objectively do that for you. Now there's two main categories, which is you have the supervised machine learning category and the supervised machine learning category will work kind of as I just described, as in you give it the input, you give it the output, and it will try to figure out how it goes from there to the output. So it requires a training set. It requires you to provide a subset of data for which you already know the answers. Where to get this training data? Well, you can use a naturally occurring set of training data. Uh, something that has been used in the past, for example, would be you might have newspaper articles that are in the sports category or in the capital markets category, and you might use that as a natural classification because you know this text has to be related to sports because it's in the sports section. This document is, or this article is in the the economy section, so it has to be related to economy or related to politics or whatever. Uh, movie reviews, they might have kind of a thumbs up or thumbs down or some rating to it, so you can use that for sentiment analysis. And also one that I find pretty cool is in order to assess difficulty, what people have done is they've used textbooks and then they would use textbooks for different grade levels with the idea that textbooks for lower grades would be easier text related to textbooks for higher grades and it would be more complicated. So they try to reverse engineer based on those kind of natural occurring data, how to get from, from your X to your Y variables. You can create your own training set as well. And for our intensive purposes, that generally is what we'll have to resort to. Um, you could do this manually. You could literally create the classifications yourself. And if you do this in a, in, a, in a responsible way, then this can definitely work. Ideally, you want to have multiple people do this just so that you're not just imposing your subjective judgment into that, although sometimes that's what you want. So that's not always a negative thing. Uh, or you could try to crowdsource your training set. So that's the method that I like to use, which would be, for example, to use Amazon Mechanical Turk, where you pay people a small amount of money to do a simple classification task for you. That allows you to get a large training data set for a relatively small amount of money. Um, and as long as you set that up correctly, that can work very well. Now you also have unsupervised machine learning and unsupervised machine learning does not require you to provide training data. All you need to do is you need to provide inputs. And you might think, well, that, that sounds way superior to the supervised machine learning because then you don't need to get a training data set. That's true, but it does come with one major caveat, which is that unsupervised machine learning can only really be used for clustering. Because what it can try to do, and word to vec is kind of in that same category or these word embeddings, is that it, it can try to figure out relationships across different documents by, the, by how similar they are by the text that's in a particular document or sentence, for example. So you can use this for clustering topic modeling, but not really much beyond that. Uh, a common technique for this would be either principal component analysis, which you might be familiar with because it's the same technique as you can apply to numerical data, but the one that tends to be more used for text is the uh, latent Dirichlet allocation or LDA for short, 
which can allow you to uncover, discover abstract topics in a subset of data without you providing it with any training data. Uh, this comes with a whole host of potential caveats. It's not a, a, a silver bullet and you need to decide the parameters and the topics that you get out of this are unlabeled and can be random depending on how you run them. So you, you might still be careful with this, but this is a powerful technique that you can use also just to get a sense descriptively of how your textual data is looking like. And you can, for example, actually represent this numerically. And I just show you this because I think it's pretty cool, which is I took some accounting paper abstracts for working papers and I put them into this LDA algorithm and I have code examples in the reference files if you want to follow along with this. And then I put it in this numerical or I put this in this visual representation and you can actually see that it created these different categories. For example, here I have a category that says top words or earnings firm information analyst. So that might be kind of stock market related. I have a topic here that relates to audit, auditor quality, firm client. So that's probably auditing related. I have a category here at the bottom that is tax income. So that's maybe tax research. Uh, this is probably also some tax research, maybe a little bit more law. And then financial reporting quality, accounting research, uh, firm performance. And this seems to be something related to corporate governance. But kind of these labels that I'm giving to these different categories, is that's just my subjective interpretation. The algorithm will just give this, spit it out to me. And then it's up to me to make subjective interpretation as to what these different clusters means. So there still is a lot of subjectivity involved here, but it's a good first step in trying to understand how your data looks like. Or sometimes this might just be what you want to get at if you want to, for example, see time trends or anything else um, when it comes to your textual data. So a couple closing remarks. Getting started with natural language processing can be pretty overwhelming. Uh, there's a lot going on about it and it's also every problem is going to be quite different just by the nature of the complexity of natural language uh, even if you have a solid understanding it can still take you quite a lot of time to understand your data and process it and then ultimately run your analysis on it um, just know that this is normal like it will also take me a lot of time and sometimes i get stumped i look at a problem and i need to figure it out so j just don't get discouraged by that and also there's nothing wrong with Googling these things. There's a lot of resource, resources out there, in particular for natural language, natural language processing. So just look these up and use them uh, and have some other steps here. I do want to take a moment to talk about the last step, which is um, that you should not get discouraged by the mathematics that are involved in kind of natural language processing papers or methods, because ultimately it's a very statistically, mathematically heavy kind of subfield but you don't really need to know too much about that in order to apply it. It's good to have a solid understanding because that helps you to understand why things work the way they do. But ultimately, if you look up a, a paper that discusses some natural language processing algorithm, as long as you know how to implement it in the right way, that's enough. You don't need to really understand how all the math that's underlying everything works because there's people that focus on that. But if you just want to implement it and you want to implement it well, you don't need to necessarily know all of that. So don't get discouraged by that either. Okay, so what's next? I, mean, I know this was a pretty dense recording. So I'd say take a second to digest all of this, take a break, and then you can move on to the demonstration video where I'll show you a couple of things in a Jupyter notebook. And then once you're done with that, you can move on with the problems and you can find the problem notebook in the GitHub repository.